Hi, I'm Dr. Terry Thamert. I'm the director for the Capital Quadrant of the Boise School District. And on behalf of the leadership team of the Boise School District, it is my pleasure to welcome you to a COVID-19 question and answer session between medical professionals in our community and students from our high schools. We are hoping that um, the information that we share with you today will help us navigate the pandemic in our community together. Joining us um, in the medical professionals are um, Dr. Nasser from St. Al's, Dr. Bramwell from St. Luke's, Dr. Curtin from St. Luke's, and Kip Dribnak from St. Luke's. Our student representatives from Boise High, we have Quentin Carney, JJ Burns, Lizzie Duke Moe. From Bora, we have Maddie Trammell. From Capital, we have Clay Hibbs. And from Timberline, we have Brooke Rolden. Thank you all for joining us today. And Brooke, do you wanna go ahead and get us started with the first question? Yes, um, okay, so the first one it reads, um, how would you describe the current state of COVID-19 in our community? Um, I, I would describe our community as still having a significant problem with COVID. Um, we have room in the hospitals currently to take care of people who are acutely ill, but we don't have room for additional sort of elective surgeries, such as a hip replacement or a shoulder replacement. Um, and we've done this intentionally so that we can take care of people who have heart attacks or appendicitis or significant COVID illness, but we still have a significant amount of COVID in the community and we're waiting with bated breath to see how things change with the vaccine. I would agree with Dr. Bramwell. We, you know, we had the initial surge of cases right after COVID first uh, came to us in the March timeframe. And then we had a period where it seemed to be on the decline for a while. And, and in the last several weeks, uh, we've been in what's called the second surge and it's much greater than the first. So even on a good day in this time period around the fall winter time frame, it's been much higher numbers compared to even that initial surge when we were trying to figure out the first steps with COVID. So we're still in the middle of that and um, trying to, as a group of uh, hospitals across the community, you know, manage all the patients that might need care within the hospital. And, and that's why in a similar way, we've had to be very thoughtful about preserving our, our people and our hospital capacity for those who truly need it at this time. What are some effective ways to maintain close contact with friends in person without risking exposure? For example, can you meet them outside? And if so, do you need to wear a mask? One of the messages I'm hoping to communicate today is, is that connecting with others is really important, even in this time. And um, the different ways to try to do that safely, which I think is a theme that I saw within some of the questions that, that you as students were trying to ask, is a really, that's a really good thing to ask. And so um, specifically, yes, I think any, we, the way we know that the virus is transmitted is through uh, droplets and that's um, with breathing um, or uh, when you're in close contact with each other. So any anything outside is gonna be probably safer than inside. And then anytime that you're gonna wear a face covering or a mask, you're gonna reduce the ability for the, um, the airborne droplets to reach another person. And so that's gonna reduce risk for sure um, and to be thoughtful about that. So um, time or, or distance apart and then the environment that you're in all, all make a difference. But trying to connect with friends or family very, very important uh, to try to do um, just from for a lot of reasons. But I think that's how, how we're made is to connect with one another. You either need to be distance or you wear a mask. Um, sometimes in the hospital, we impose and uh, on, on everybody. So you, ha if you, you have to be distance and you have to wear a mask. But a lot of the times in the community um, or has, has, has been enough. So if you're getting together with some friends and you're outside, and you're able to distance, um, then, then maybe masks aren't always needed, though I would say that they probably will be helpful, frankly, even though they're a pain in the neck or on the face. Um, 
the, the other compelling reason to wear a mask, at least based on what I've seen with my own kids is uh, nobody stays six feet apart. Everyone's close to each other and saying hi and hugging each other. And, and, and in a sense, the masks kind of make up or help minimize the risk when you know you're gonna be closer to other people. So I, I think that, that wearing masks is, is something that will just help you even though it's uncomfortable. Why is it important to have a close cohort of close friends that you can meet with face to face? And do you have any ideas of how to do this successfully? You know, what I, what I mentioned already is you wanna try and minimize your exposure to people who are outside your immediate family. But one of the things that some people have come up with is the idea of having a pod. Um, my, my own daughter, who's a, a junior, does this, this very thing. She has, I think, four friends and they see each other all the time and they study together. But, but it's kind of like having an exclusive relationship. Um, those four people have to only hang out with this pod. They can't hang out with other people. They can't get a new girlfriend. And I mean, it's the, the way that the pod is successful or the way that it's a lot like your, your nuclear family is you're not seeing other people and you're not uh, mingling uh, outside of that group. So, um, you know, the, the safest thing and the hardest thing is to stay in your house uh, with your family, taking care of each other and not branching out. But that's not very realistic for any long period of time. Um, we have all struggled with that this year, uh, now that we're 10 months into this. So, you know, the, the next safest thing is to have a pod of friends um, that you get together and you're seeing each other regularly and you're being careful, like we've already mentioned. That's, that's one way, I think, around the idea of being completely isolated. So some people are fatigued by the ongoing restrictions and limitations that are in place. So a couple questions, how much longer do you think we're back to normal? Um, what will help us get back to normal? And will people be wearing masks into the future after the vaccine? I think recognizing that what we would call COVID fatigue or fatigue with, with everything that we're trying to do with COVID is very, very understandable and real. I think um, it's probably being felt by you um, as, as high school students. It's certainly being felt, um, I think, across the community. I can say that it's, it's, it's also being felt even in, in the workplace, you know, where we're at. I think what calls us to continue to do our best is the recognition that we're trying to take care of each other <clears throat> and um, reduce risk for others in our community. And so that's what drives us to be motivated to continue with the measures that we know seem to be making a difference. Um, I think uh, this will pass. Uh, this, th this will not be forever, but if, I do think one thing to consider is that it's probably going to be the long, a long race that we're gonna have to be thinking about some ebbs and flows with this virus. I think this last week, we've had some of the most exciting news as far as the battle with COVID and that's the introduction of the vaccine in our community, starting out with the healthcare workers that are receiving it, as far as turning the corner, you know, on, on this, uh, on this fight. <clears throat> but um, I think taking a long perspective and not um, saying, okay, well, this is going to be, you know, done in a few weeks, and then we'll be back to normal. But just mentally adjusting to let's do what we can, you know, together to get through this is, is, is the better way to go. And, and and trying to encourage one another when we do get fatigued, because that's very real. And uh, I think everybody's ready for it, for uh, life to return to what we what we knew. But I think the second part of your question is, are we going to in the future have some, um, are things going to be a little bit different? And they may be. Um, it may be a situation where when we're sick in the future, we, we cover up or we stay away from each other more because we're aware of how viruses can be transmitted. And we have a, a little more attention placed on um, you know, the different ways that we try to keep our hands clean or common services clean or, or the, our environments, you know, in order to, to reduce spread. Other countries have been doing that probably more than we have um, that see different viruses running through their spaces. And so I think we'll probably learn some longstanding things that will continue in how, in how we uh, do what we do. And then there, there'll be some of the other um, measures that we're taking now that we can probably relax on as the number of cases go down in the community and it's not quite such a risk for, for so many people. I think everybody's tired of this. 
Um, you, you guys may be feeling it more because you're so plugged into your friends, but um, I, I guarantee you, your parents are hurting, your grandparents are hurting, um, your grandparents may be the most isolated they've ever been in their entire lives. Um, everybody is used to more face-to-face -face and more high-five and shoulder punching than, than we have been able to do for really this whole year. Um, and, and, and as Mark said, I, I, think, uh, I think there's great hope with, with the vaccines that have arrived and are, are arriving, but uh, I, I think we still have a handful of months uh, in, in being pretty strict. A point to remember is that you know, we live in a world where the, you know, the, the information is at our fingertips and, and we're not used to a situation where, where we don't know or where there's not an answer. And uh, I think one of the tremendously fatiguing things about this scenario is um, there's a lot that, that we still don't know. And, and your question about how long will this last, it's a great question. Um, but right now, the answer to that is purely speculative. And that's hard for all of us because we live in a world where things are fairly clear cut usually. And if we're looking for an answer, it's at our fingertips. And the world has changed drastically during uh, our lifetime in that regard. This having information so readily available is, is, is a fantastic thing and it's wonderful. But I think it leaves us a little um, unprepared at times for uh, difficult questions that don't have clear cut answers. And I think we will continue to learn about this, this virus and this pandemic and we'll learn more answers as we go. Uh, but as for how long it's going to last, I, I just don't think we know that. That's uncomfortable for all of us, whether we're high school juniors and seniors or whether we've been practicing medicine for 25 years. Uh, none of us have seen anything like this. It's, it's, it's really a challenge. So what is one reason students should continue to follow guidelines that they've all heard? What you're doing works. When we limit our exposures, when we stay home when we're sick or symptomatic, when we wear a mask pretty uh, uh, regularly, we are able to limit the spread of this disease. That may not be something that you guys are seeing um, uh, really regularly, but it's something that we talk about in the hospital all the time about where it's working well, where it isn't working well, which communities are doing a good job, which communities are not doing a good job and, and I'll just tell you that, that the, the, the distancing and the masking works. And uh, you guys have been troopers in doing this uh, when, when you've been at school and, and for the most part when you've been out with your friends. So just, just hang in there. The reason to stay the course and, <laughs> and continue doing what you've been doing is, is that it's a gift to others around, around us to try to help especially for those who might be most vulnerable if they were to get COVID. Um, thankfully, most people do well when they do get it. You may have some family or friends who have had it and you've seen that, or maybe some of you in your class have, have even come down with it yourself. But there's, there's some number that don't do so well and they end up into the hospital um, or the most severe heart part of the hospital, the intensive care unit of the hospital where we really try to have to provide that critical care so that's, that's the, the main reason to continue is to care for those around us um, or to try to help those around us. And it's hard when you can't see it <laughs> um, and you don't know if what you're doing makes a difference, but I would just say it does make a difference.